This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I'd like to call the Village Board of Ashwabnan to order for Tuesday, July 25th, 2023. Roll call, please. President Kardoski. Here. Trustee Service. Here. Trustee Paul. Here. Trustee Zerbel. Here. Trustee Atkinson. Here. Trustee Krieger is excused and Trustee Flu Tracy Flukey. Here. Please stand for the pledge. And please remember our men and women throughout the world in uniform. Um, I have no changes to the agenda. I need a motion to approve, please. Move to approve as presented. Second. Motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. Action on the minutes, open and closed minutes from June 27, 2023, and the special village board open minutes for July 11, 2023. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve those minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. Number six, comments from the public must be limited to items not on the agenda. Must state your name and address, limited to five minutes. The board's role is to listen and not discuss the item. Personnel issues cannot be discussed nor individuals named, and the board is not able to take action at this meeting. Are there any comments from the public that's not on tonight's agenda? Comments from the public uh, not on tonight's agenda? Anybody online have any comments? Okay. Hearing none, we're gonna move on. Number seven, I have no written communications or announcements. Anybody have anything? Okay, we'll move on. Number eight, oh, this is the fun part. Um, the promotion of public safety supervisors. Chief. Thank you. Again, appreciate the board uh, giving us a little bit of time to introduce you to our newest supervisors. Uh, we had two tests, uh, promotions here. Um, both the lieutenant and captain processes were conducted. Uh, they both went through uh, a thorough screening. Um, we had excellent internal candidates for this position, both of these positions actually. So um, it is my pleasure to announce uh, our two new supervisors. First, I'll ask Brady to come up. I'd like them to stand up here with me while I talk about them a little bit. <laughs> All right, right here, sir. I'll shake your hand. We'll do, it, we'll do it again, too. Sure. All right. yeah. Well. yeah, yeah. So uh, Brady was hired as a public safety officer in 2008. Over the past 15 years, Brady has served as a paramedic, a field training officer, an explorer advisor, a member of the Brown County Mobile Field Force, and is currently a member of the Brown County SWAT team. Brady has also served in the United States Marine Corps. So. Thank you very much for your service for that. We're shaking hand on that one, thank you. Um, with the advanced skills that he has in firearms, he is used uh, by our department extensively um, for firearms and as a DAT instructor. So with that, we very much want to introduce Brady and congratulate him for his promotion to Lieutenant. So congratulations, Brady. Thanks. Now the fun part, his wife Kirsten will come up and Tack on that badge. And don't worry, if you stab him, we have a paramedic or two here. <laughs> <laughs> There's no pressure. Nobody's looking. Don't worry. <laughs> Did I get that wrong? Were you, are you Army? Shoot. I apologize. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. You know, those Army and those Marine guys, they're, they're sensitive about that stuff. So. <laughs> Uh, next is uh, Doug McDonough, come on up. 
You hiding back there? I didn't even see you. Yeah. So Doug, uh, he has worked for public safety uh, for 22 years. Uh, he was hired as a public safety officer in 2001. And in tw can I, you want to read that for no. me? No, no. 2004, Doug advanced to, um, to the paramedic. Uh, beyond his regular duties, Doug served as an explorer advisor for five years, a field training officer for nine years. Uh, he has extensive knowledge in the fire operations, and we are very lucky to have him as a fire, uh, fire and firearms instructor. In 2016, Doug was promoted to lieutenant, and he served in that capacity until he was promoted to the captain position. So congratulations, Doug. Thank you. Now, all this pressure that I put on people, Doug has now put it on me to put on the badge. So we'll see if we can do this. So it goes on like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> He's a paramedic, you just said, so he can stitch himself up. <laughs> you don't have any military service I can mess up, do you? Yeah. Okay, all right, good. Congratulations, Doug. We appreciate it. So both of these guys have done an amazing job for us. Um, I just want to say congratulations again. Uh, we are looking so forward to their leadership in both capacities. Um, and now you've seen our two newest supervisors. So thank you for the time. We appreciate it. Congratulations again, guys. Congratulations. Thanks. OK, now moving on, number nine. Action on the consent agenda, 9A, the budgeted expenditures, 9B, the June year-to-date general fund financial report, 9C is the investment report, 9D is the public works department report, 9E is the park, rec, and forestry department report. And that's it. I need a motion to approve unless anybody would like anything pulled from this agenda. Can we pull 9B? I just have a quick question for Greg. Okay. We'll pull, do, do we get a motion to approve everything but 9B? Move to approve everything but 9B. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with taking 9B out. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried, thank you. Okay. Um, question, Greg, on the miscellaneous revenues category. The other miscellaneous, it's 161,000 and typically you budget 21, so I'm wondering what's all in there. We received the annual transit refund, or the, the, for the Green Bay Transit provides us uh, refunded dollars, so that was significantly higher than we had budgeted. They had actually gone through a whole cost restructure and repriced out the cost to all the municipalities in the area, and they thought they had a little bit better, more accurate number, but apparently still got a big refund. I'm guessing they're still getting maybe some federal aids kicking in that they have to share out with other communities. So that's what that is. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we need a motion to approve 9B. Motion to approve 9B. Second. Motion and a second to approve 9B. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried, thank you. Number 10, public hearing. Public hearing regarding ordinance number 07-2-23, rezoning a portion of 1270 West Main Avenue, parcel VA-L360-2, from R11 family residence to B3 community business. Joel, I'll let you take this. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the requested rezoning is to change the zoning of a portion of parcel VAL 360 2 from R1 single family residence to B3 community business. 4K commercial properties or CPR rents. Um, as the property owner to the east is in the process of purchasing that portion that is identified on the map on your screen. Uh, and it has historically been used, that land and building, for its business purposes. The requested rezoning will make the B3 zoning boundaries consistent with the new boundaries of that purchase um, or of that parcel following purchase. Okay. Any questions? Looks like it was a five to one vote. What was the objection? 
from the one person who well, did. Well, this is the public hearing, so. Correct. We'll get that right at the, okay. at the action item. Yeah. Is there anybody here who'd like to speak for or against this rezoning since this is a public hearing? Anybody who would like to speak for or against this? Anybody who would like to speak for or against this rezoning? <clears throat> okay, hearing none, I need a motion to close the hearing. Motion to close the hearing. Second. Motion and a second to close the hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. <clears throat> the hearing is closed. Okay, now we'll move on to action items. 11A, action regarding ordinance number 07-2-23, rezoning a portion of 1270 West Main Avenue, parcel VA-L360-2 from R11 family residence to B3 community business. Okay, anybody have any questions for Joel? It looks like it was a five to one vote. I'm just wondering what was the objection? I objected to it when it came through um, for me to take a parcel and divide off a chunk of land and turn it into B3. Um, in my opinion, it devalues the house, makes it more undesirable. Um, so I was against it. You know, I understand your concerns. Uh, Knowing the property, knowing nobody complained about the rezoning, I thought it was a good move because that piece of property right now looks worse than a junkyard. It is not helping the area whatsoever. Uh, so, uh, and I understand what you're saying. I, I'd like that shed myself on my property, but absolutely, th th this is not. The, this is fine the way it is where it's going. I believe. If there's no other questions, I'll move to approve the uh, rezoning on this property. I just have a couple questions, so. Okay, I need a second I'm first. Sorry. Second then. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Okay, Tracy. Um, just a question on um, the R1 zoning there. It's B3 to the north and then also to the east. Are our plans in the future to rezone that all to business? Is that what our zoning map, future zoning map would say? I would need to do a little bit of research on that, but I believe so with Main Avenue being a main corridor in the community, I believe based on that location, um, that would be consistent with with the, the other parcels immediately to the east. So that R1 that's on the corner, um, you know, at some point maybe that home goes away and that converts to a business property as well. But I'll, I'll confirm that here shortly. Okay. And is there anybody living in the house right now? Does anybody know or is it vacant? It is occupied. It is occupied? Okay. You know, if this building was all by itself with R1 around it, I'd be opposed to it. But it's not. It butts up to our, our uh, a B1 uh, business. So I don't see a problem there. Spot zoning, I disagree with. This here, I think, is very legitimate. Well, and I'm not saying it is, Gary. I was just asking what future zoning was for that area. I would agree with you because um, it does have B3 well, on this, this the east is side what of it. We're talking about right now, so I'll I'll re say I'll approve this as presented. To answer Tracy's question uh, earlier, it would be consistent with the comprehensive plan for that type of land use. Uh, with that being said, I believe that that. The shed that's there is currently being used by the business operator. Um, so in order to purchase the property and make it legally conforming to the zoning district, the rezoning would be required in, an, in order to match that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Is there any other questions, comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 07-2-23. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Thank you. 11B, action on special event application for the Green Bay Packers kickoff concert. This is before the board due to the special event policy. Um, we need approval 
for Southridge Road closure at Lombardi Avenue and Mike Ovenger Way. Um, they told me they were gonna have someone here to answer any questions, but I don't see anyone. Um, no, this is just a rinse and repeat of the, the concert that has gone on there before in that location. So um, shouldn't be any different than those previous concerts there. Uh, I know that they're gonna have the stage set back a little bit farther um, in the parking lot there. So Green Bay is gonna be responsible for a few more people, which is good for us, but the staffing is probably gonna be about the same. I'd make a motion to approve the special event application for the Green Bay Packers kickoff event. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the special event application for the Packers kickoff concert 2023. Any more comments? How yeah. long is this being closed for? Is it just for the concert itself or is this going into a day and a night deal? No, it'll just be for the concert itself. So it'll be a few hours before and a few hours after. Okay, thank you. It, Gary, it looks like um, three to seven and then, yeah. so. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 11C, action on special event application for the Vietnam Army Ranger LRRP Welcome Home. Chris. Again, this is a special event application um, and they want to close Armed Forces Drive between Oneida Street and Holmgren Way. And I know that Joe is on the line and I think he'd like to say a few words. Okay, since this involves the event, do we need to open the floor? I don't think we need to open the floor, or do we? Motion to open the floor. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to open the floor. Is all those in favor say aye? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried, thank you. The floor is open, Joe, if you would like to make any comments. Me Joe, too. Joe, if you're trying to talk, it looks like your mic is still muted. He's still muted. Can you hear us, Joe? Well, I know that he um, included in his packet a little um, summary of what they're doing and he's very proud of this. I think it's it's a great thing. He wants to make sure that they know that they what they did was just wonderful and to get the welcome back that they deserve. So um, if Joe can't speak, I know that's what he wanted everyone to know. Yeah, it looks like Holmgren will be closed and maybe Brian knows it's 1400 to 1700, so three hours basically. Yeah. That yep. They'll have it closed for. Um, it does look like a great event. I read all that information mm -hmm. and I'm gonna make, try to get out there to see him come in, but um, I would make a motion to approve the event. Second. Motion and a second to approve the special event application for the Vietnam Army Ranger LRRP Welcome Home. Before we say that, no, Tracy, you said that Holmgren was? I'm sorry, I meant Armed Forces Armed Way. For, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. I just yep. want to clarify that. Yeah, so. sorry. Okay. Um, this, any... is, this is just Armed Forces oh. Way? Just Armed Forces Armed, Way. Just Armed okay. Forces. Okay. Yeah, right. we need a motion That's also not... to close the floor. Motion to close the floor. Second. Motion and a second to close the floor. All those in favor say aye. No, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the floor is closed. We have a motion and a second uh, to approve the special event. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, 11D, action on 2023 Ashwabnan Blast alcohol sales. Rex. Uh, this is similar to what we've done in other years. Really, it's the same thing. Ashwabanan Blast will be held on Saturday, August 12th. Um, it is confined to Ashwabame Park. Uh, it's put on jointly by the Ashwabanan Alumni Association as well as the village who are doing all the carnival games and the bounce houses and some of the fun stuff for the kids. Um, we do sell beer at the event and typically what we do is we bring this forward to the village board and, 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 and get permission 
uh, via the Alumni Association for the, for the beer sales at the event. Standard procedure, Rex, for how many years? I believe this started with the high school's 50th anniversary, which was in 2015, I believe. 15 it was, okay. All right, move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the Ash Robin and Blast alcohol sales. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. 11 Thank you. E. Consider discuss act on village of Ashwabnan ordinance number 07-1-23 amending prohibited parking areas. Is that cheap? I can start it, Mary. Oh, okay, Patrick. Uh, this was a request from public safety in particular the, the SROs to look at um, kind of a, a vehicle blocking and a backup in particularly on Cormier or at Cormier School there, there was a bus bump out that was created, um, I think somewhat recently, and there are no parking prohibited signs there. Um, so what the SROs and the principal have seen at Cormier is some of the cars have parked and then once one sees another car parked, they kind of have a backup and a backlog on that bus bump out, creating an issue for the buses. Um, what this would, this ordinance would do is not only um, uh, limit bus, uh, excuse me, limit vehicle parking on uh, like bus only or emergency vehicle parking only at Cormier, but also every other school. So it essentially is in the discretion of the school as well as public safety to determine where uh, school bus parking would be uh, during school hours and during the month schools are in session um, and then place signs. So this will authorize uh, DPW to work with the schools and, and public safety to post signs and then obviously enforce if, school, if uh, vehicles are not moved. Um, from those designated areas. So with any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, staff would recommend approving. Knowing the congestions by all the schools, uh, I think this is a good idea. Uh, I go by a couple of them once in a while, so I don't know why people think they can park anywhere when the buses are sitting there trying to jockey through traffic. So if there's no other questions, I'll move to approve ordinance 07-123. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 07-1-23. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion carried. Thank you. 11F, consider discuss act on fire inspection service contract. Chief. Yep, thank you. Um, so we have our lead in fire inspector is uh, resigning and moving to South Carolina. So we have uh, a hole to fill. Um, what we'd like to do is hire an outside service to complete the rest of our inspections. Uh, we have approximately 1,500 inspections to do uh, the remainder of the year. Uh, their cost is $23 per inspection. Um, so what that does is that leaves us at a balance of about 34,500. With our lead in, uh, inspector leaving, um, his salary plus benefits, you can see we will actually be under budget in that area. And then we'll have to make a decision going into 24. We'll probably continue with the inspection services as we decide how to reimagine the fire inspection department with our agency. Um, so with that, if you have any questions, I certainly can answer them. Commander Murphy's here as well. He's um, in charge of um, the fire uh, inspection department as well. So uh, please let us know if you have any questions on that, but if not, I'm looking for approval. You know, we've had this before. We've had uh, private people coming in and doing the inspections. I thought it worked great. Uh, they were very well to work with, so I don't have any problem with this at all. Um, Chief, I was just wondering if there's multiple companies that do this kind of work or there's just a few if you're going to do an RFP or if you have one in mind already. I'll let Brian answer that because he was in charge of kind of seeking out other agencies. There are not really all that many in the state. There are two that I reached out to. Uh, one that had done uh, fire inspections for uh, Whitewater and a couple other municipalities and uh, replied to us and gave us their um, numbers as far as costs for doing this. I did reach out to a, another company that appeared to be capable of doing this and I had not heard anything back. And looking at some of the municipalities that they listed, uh, they appeared to be much smaller in size than ours. 
So as of right now, we have one company that has responded to us and in conversations with them, um, it appears that uh, they are uh, willing and able to certainly meet our needs for the remainder of this year. And really that's kind of the driving force on this is uh, we are mandated to perform at least one general fire inspection of each of our commercial and uh, places of employment uh, per calendar year. And if we fail to do that or substantially comply with that requirement, it does put uh, over $100,000 of state aid into jeopardy. So we are uh, a little bit behind right now and that's why we're looking to uh, go with the, uh, the company that has been at least uh, working with us on this proposal. Okay, thank you. If, if looking forward, um, once we get through this here, if there's a cost savings outsourcing it, what's the need to do it in-house? Not saying that's that's a bad idea. I'm just wondering, is there more of a comfort level, or is there benefits of doing it in-house? No, as you know, we're a unique community. We have a, a lots going on here. We have inspections that also entail tent inspections. We have special events that we need to inspect as well. So not saying that this company couldn't do that. Um, they may be able to do that. They'd have to hire more people to do that. So we'll have to take a look at that. That's something we'll certainly consider um, and how we want to do those things going forward. But at least right now, as, as Commander Murphy said, we need to be substantially and compliant with that one inspection. And we've been kind of hurting the last few years of doing that. So. At some point, the state's going to come down on us here. So we need to make sure we do that. Uh, this company seems to think they'll have no problem getting these 1,500, 1500 inspections in by the end of the year, which will put us in compliance. And then we'll see. You know, we also want to provide an avenue for our officers to uh, be successful, have other opportunities as well. So as we go forward, it might still be kind of a hybrid system. We're still kind of working out the details on that, but we'll bring that forward probably during budget time. Okay, thank you. Yep. So then we'll just get into a contract basically for this year until the end of the year. With Correct. This company. Yep. Yep. How many fire inspection officers are there right now? Right now, currently we have one full time and two part time. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. There's no other questions. I'll move to approve as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the <clears throat> fire inspection service contract as presented. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 11G, action on mini pumper purchase. Chief. Okay, we have a uh, pretty unique opportunity here to get rid of one of our really old and aging pumpers uh, that we have out at station two, a 1993 Pierce pumper. Um, Howard is looking to sell a vehicle that they received on a grant and then they put about $30,000 in it to get an ultra high pressure on it as well. So they're willing to sell this vehicle that's worth approximately $225,000 to us for $30,000. Um, this would be a more multi-use vehicle for us we would still house it at, at station two, but it can be used during Packer game days. It can be used as, uh, it could be used by fire inspectors. It could be used as a backup for a CSO vehicle if we need to. We had one go down here recently. So um, we're really looking for a, a better use vehicle, multi-purpose vehicle, um, and this really fits the bill in that regard. When we sell the 1993 pumper, I really don't know what we're gonna get out of it, but we're gonna get something maybe $15,000, maybe more, I don't know. But that will go back into the fund, obviously, to offset some of these costs. So the cost of the vehicle is about 30,000, probably take another $15,000 to set it up, minus whatever we get for the sale of the 93 pumper. Chief, is this ready to go the way I'm looking at it? I mean, you don't have to add any more equipment on it? Well, we have $15,000 that we'd have for setup costs. Or you you do have to modify it to make yeah well we got to put we got to put radio we got to put graphics on it that kind of stuff so okay and a, a mobile data computer in it so, so that is my question what how why didn't Howard have to put those things on it to use it in Howard but we need them on I'll, I'll let Brian answer that because he's been in communication with <clears throat> Captain Staven over there so as far as equipment for the uh, setup costs I'd be looking at a uh, mobile radio, um, compatible with our mobile radios. I'd be looking at a mobile data computer, 
uh, utilize for computer-aided dispatch and uh, data retrieval and report writing. And I'd also be looking at uh, taking off the Howard Fire Department graphics and adding new ones in there. There are a couple things that are to be determined yet, uh, the radio being the big one. It does have a Howard Fire Department radio in it right now. Um, Howard is unsure if that's gonna be included with the vehicle or not. If that is included in the vehicle, that would shave off uh, approximately four to $5,000 potentially in that setup cost. As far as the uh, mobile data computer, um, Howard has a uh, older model that is uh, out of date and I believe unserviceable and that one they removed and are uh, keeping. And the mount for that one as well is not compatible with what we utilize for mobile data computers with our vehicle fleet. Okay. I notice here it has a new acquisition cost of approximately $225,000, but this is a 2012 according to this. How much wear, how much wear is on this? And what, what would be the present value of it? Years old. Correct. So the way this vehicle is set up, it is a uh, Ford uh, F550 uh, chassis. That is actually a uh, 2013. Um, that uh, chassis has a uh, Pierce built box put on the back of it. Uh, that was original to it. So that box is from 20, uh, 2013. Um, and then it has a uh, skid mounted uh, ultra high pressure uh, pump system in the back of it. That is from 2020. That was applied aftermarket. So as far as the age and condition of the vehicle, we did have our uh, garage staff take a look at it uh, and they recommended uh, purchase of the vehicle that there were no mechanical concerns with it. Uh, we did take it for a test drive. Um, it is in good uh, visual shape. It is in good operational shape from uh, what we can tell. Um, and the other benefits with this and uh, really what we're looking at is long-term uh, usability. The box that's on the back of it can be remounted onto a different chassis at some point in the future. And uh, in speaking with our service technician, uh, as we research this, the box on the back is about 10 years old right now. If it had to get mounted onto a, uh, another uh, chassis at some point, for example, if this one uh, did happen to develop an issue, um, it could very well be remounted as long as the wheelbase is the same. Uh, and the skid mounted pump on the back could also be remounted uh, with that box onto a different chassis or to a different vehicle, or at some point in the future, if we saw the need, uh, it could be sold as a unit in and of itself. Okay, and then, but being a 2012, it's still, what, nine, nine, 10 years fresher than what we have currently, the one you're gonna sell? Correct, and actually, uh, the vehicle that we're gonna be replacing with this is a uh, 1993 Pierce pumper, and that pumper is a reserve pumper. We currently have two reserve pumpers in our fleet. The issue that we get with that is uh, maintenance costs. Uh, every year per NFPA standards, we do have to do annual pump maintenance and we do have to certify that that pump meets NFPA standards. That would not be a requirement with uh, the ultra high pressure. That is a requirement for reserve pumpers. Um, so we don't, we don't necessarily need two full size reserve pumpers in our fleet at the moment, uh, really one will do us just fine as far as rotating for planned and unplanned uh, fleet maintenance. Um, really what this vehicle, what the current uh, 93 Pierce pumper provides us is a reserve pumper out at station two for station two use and uh, an extra vehicle for uh, shuttling crews around if we need to. And uh, I don't think we need a reserve pumper out there. We can utilize the one reserve pumper in our fleet. And as far as shuttling crews, uh, this vehicle would be a lot more efficient and economical for doing that. Okay. It, it, any idea that the old one, how much more life you're going to get out of that? If you could guess that. The, uh, the old pumper that we're looking at selling? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that is to be determined. It's actually in pretty good shape. Uh, we've been keeping up with the maintenance on it. We've been keeping up with the pump certification on it. Uh, we have not certified it yet this year, especially if it's going to be sold. Uh, but I do have interest from a neighboring municipality already in uh, looking to acquire that from us. Um, they want to do their due diligence, of course, and have their mechanic take a look at it. But uh, yeah, I've already got one uh, interested party. Um, and if that falls through, we can also uh, put it up for auction, um, and explore other avenues for disposing of it. Okay, thank you. And, and real quickly to answer your question, I just did a quick search on, the closest one I could find was like a 2013 Ford F550. This one sold for $135,000. So 
I, I don't know exactly what it's going to be worth. I'm sure there's going to be some variation, but I think we're getting a pretty good deal on it. Okay. Thank you. I would have to say financially, knowing the cost of trucks, you're doing pretty good. There's a 550 bare bone truck, pickup truck, uh, probably sell for that price anyway. So you're getting all your fire equipment probably free then. So I don't see a problem in, in taking an opportunity and buying something like this for the cost that they're willing to give it away. Um, the, this, the uh, uh, area or the person or uh, area that wants it is a fifteen thousand dollar out of the reach for them for for the trade for the cost of it of the used one. We haven't talked firm uh, numbers yet; just very preliminary discussions about it. I don't suspect that would be, but I can't uh, speak for them on that point right now. Okay, you haven't discussed it. Okay. Yeah, and looking at the prices of uh, comparable fire apparatus of that age and that style, the, the prices can be pretty variable. Um, so it's hard to get a definite estimate, but um, I, I don't think that would necessarily be out of line to be looking in the 15,000 range. Um, either Brian, would you say these two vehicles are very different and can do different things? And if so, what are we losing by going to the new vehicle versus the pumper that we have right now? What kind of capability, I guess, would we be losing? So yeah, these vehicles are um, very different in what they provide. Uh, the 93 Pierce pumper is your traditional fire engine, um, has a, a traditional uh, pump on it, hose load, everything else, um, higher maintenance standards uh, that we have to maintain it to for NFPA standards. The vehicle we're purchasing uh, is really kind of an updated, uh, more advanced version of the uh, mini pumper we sold to the airport, I believe five, four or five years ago. Um, I think that one we sold for 20,000 and that was a uh, older vehicle, had an older style uh, pump on the back of it. Um, so what this one provides for capability is this provides us capability for special event use. This provides us capability for a more efficient way to uh, move crews around, whether those crews be additional paid on call crews shuttling from one station to another, responding to a fire scene, going to uh, training, um, or uh, whatever other uh, purchase or whatever other use we may have for uh, moving crews and equipment uh, around. Um, the mini pumper does have some similar capabilities. It does have uh, a crew cab on it. We can fit four people in there. It does have brackets integral into the cab for mounting self-contained breathing apparatus. Uh, in short, it can transport fully equipped firefighters wherever we, we need to take them uh, at a lot uh, less maintenance, uh, a lot uh, more maneuverability compared to a full-size pumper. Good discussion. Okay. Um, one of the things I did want to ask, whenever a fire apparatus leaves the garage, you have to have X amount of people on it. Does this require the same or no? I, I'm just curious. No, this one uh, would not. So the, the vehicle it's replacing is a uh, reserve pumper. So for ratings that we go by, for example, the uh, insurance, the uh, ISO ratings, the insurance ratings, uh, we're an ISO three department. Um, pretty comfortably within the ISO 3 range. Our last uh, assessment was um, 2022 with the result published in 2023. ISO 3 is a very respectable, that's what we were previously, um, and that's what we are now. With those ISO ratings, they do look at your frontline fire apparatus fleet and how you staff it. Uh, they do also look at reserve fleet as well, reserve pumpers, reserve ladder trucks. And for the size of our fleet, we really only get credit for having one reserve pumper and currently we have two. So the impact on um, having this uh, reserve pumper leave our fleet uh, is gonna be pretty significant from a maintenance standpoint and should be a negligible effect on our uh, ISO rating. And as far as how we staff it, it's a, it's a utility vehicle, so it's not necessarily a first out fire apparatus. Uh, so out of station two, they get a, a paid on call fire call. Their first out apparatus is gonna be either the engine or the uh, squad out of there. This would be a, a utility vehicle. Uh, so if they have a lot of paid on call staff that arrives and maybe they can't fit in the engine, we can either have them utilize that uh, mini pumper to come over to station one and backfill there or respond to the scene if need be. 
We can utilize it for uh, special events. It's a lot more maneuverable for Packer game days or Art Street or any other similar type event. Um, and it has a uh, capable pump on the back that Howard has used successfully for uh, car fires, small fires, similar to uh, what we would use a mini pumper for. Um, and then also the ability to at least uh, do a first quick hit and hopefully reset a fire even on a uh, room and contents fire. It's not okay. going to put it out, but it's going to at least buy you some time with that initial quick response and that quick hit. Okay, thank you. So if I'm understanding this correct, the difference between the two vehicles, one would be the new one that you're looking at getting, or the one from Howard, would be usable for a lot more than the pumper is. You wouldn't take the pumper and go to a, a class or anything. That would not be something you would use it for. So you have a lot more flexibility with this new vehicle and to be able to use it in a lot of different ways. Is that a fair statement? That's for... completely fair and that's our plan with it. Yeah. Yeah. Move to approve the mini pumper purchase. Second. Okay, motion and a second to approve the mini pumper purchase. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank Opposed. you. Thank you. Motion carried. Okay, 11H, action on vehicle purchase pre-approval. Chief. Yeah, it's, it's all me tonight so far, I think. I don't know. <laughs> um, this is just uh, uh, in preparation for uh, squad purchases, as you guys are all familiar, it's very tough to get squads now. Um, we have a very small window to place our order, and it's usually, we don't really get a whole lot of notice. So what we're asking for you is for, I guess, a commitment for 2024. When that window opens, which we, we expect it to be any time now, that we could place that order for three additional squads for next year. Um, we're looking at a supervisor, Tahoe, uh, unmarked and two Ford police interceptor vehicles. Uh, I've listed the amounts in there for the budget. So um, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Joel, if you have anything you'd like to add, please feel free. But we're really looking for that that opportunity to, to, to purchase these vehicles. Because like I said, it doesn't happen. It happens quick. And when we have that small window, it's, it could be a day, it could be a week at the most. We have, uh, we have to put it in for that. The only thing I'll add is that this has been kind of an ongoing strategy that we've been using for the last about two and a half, almost three years now since COVID with supply chain issues on vehicles. As Chief had mentioned, we usually get a very short window. These are specialized vehicles. Usually it's a day or two, maybe a week at best that you can actually place your order in. So we just wanna make sure that we're, we're prepped and prepared for that, that order. Um, the other thing I'll note is obviously this is a commitment that hasn't been formally vetted through the budget process, but obviously these purchases would be incorporated then into the budget based on that pre-approval. Uh, so just be mindful of that, that you are authorizing a kind of a future expenditure. With that being said, we have traditionally replaced about three three patrol vehicles annually within within public safety. So this isn't anything extraordinary than what we've done over the last several years. And it's pretty practical for the department to replace two to three vehicles on an annual basis. So really Bye. all we're doing is just planning for the 24 budget. Mm -hmm. That's all we're doing. All right, if there's no other questions, we'll move to approve. Second. Can I ask one quick question? Um, with equipment, Brian, does that include the mobile data terminal, terminals and the lights and sirens and all that stuff, or is that? Yeah, this is with equipment included. Everything yep, included. Everything included. Okay, thank you. Is this going to lock in a, a price necessarily? Nope, nope, this is just what we anticipate the cost to be. Okay. It, they could be lower, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I've any reason for uh, Fords and GMs? Uh, well, the only you know, GM. Why aren't they all one make? Yeah, the only GM vehicles uh, are the Tahoes. Those are bigger vehicles, more expensive. Um, the other vehicle that is similar to the Fords is the Dodge uh, Durangos, but the sheriff's office put in for a bunch of them last year. They didn't get any. So you know, you know we. I know Dodges. <laughs> <laughs> Been down that road already. You might have to arm wrestle. Oh, you might have to arm wrestle Joel on that one. So somebody's smiling and giving me the bird. <laughs> I've been here so long that Sorry, I remember. Greg. I remember when um, these these prices were like forty six thousand yeah. dollars for the squad. So yeah, prices have gone up. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any other comments, concerns, questions? Enough was said. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 11 I National Night Out. Chief. Yeah, nothing uh, really to add on this. I think we spoke uh, at length. We will be participating in National Night Out. I believe there are five uh, locations, including Sand Acres Park for this year. We put out uh, social media on that as well. Okay. This is just uh, information. Information only. Thank you. 11K, Consider Discuss Act on Village of Ashwaubenon Ordinance Number 07-3-23 relating to alcohol licensing procedures. Uh, Madam President, in case I missed something, we missed skipped skip. item oh, J. I skipped J. Okay, I'm thank sorry. you. I was like, I think I. That's because Jay's not here. That's yeah. why I skipped J. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 11 J, 2024 budget timeline. Greg. Oh, thank you. I had been rehearsing this all day. So, <laughs> um, so this is the budget timeline. Every July, uh, bring before you our anticipated timeline for the upcoming year's budget. I know it's July. But uh, that's, this is the reality where we're in. So not much is different than we've had the last few years. Uh, mm -hmm. We kind of work backwards. We have to adopt uh, by the end of November. So we set our board meeting as a final adoption of the budget. Uh, we try to do early in November where we have the joint finance personnel and village board meeting to discuss and review the budget. And then work backwards and we kick it off to the staff on August 21st and then all the meet in between is Preparing it, reviewing it, waiting for numbers from the state, final numbers here, final numbers there, and then we'll provide some updates along the way at, at the board meetings in August and September and, and October uh, as things come along. So it's a similar timeline that we followed. It works really well. Uh, we don't typically get final assessment valuation from the state till really that real early November. So it's, sometimes it's hard to get that final, final uh, tax rate locked in. But we generally have a pretty good uh, prediction of that so if you have any questions or concerns, uh, but this would be kind of what we're gonna follow over the next few months. Any questions for Greg on the budget timeline? Okay, basically that was information only. Thanks Greg for putting that together. Okay, now 11K. Consider, discuss, act on Village of Ashwaubenon Ordinance Number 07-3-23 relating to alcohol licensing procedures. Okay, Patrick. thank you. I think this is just easier for me to kind of discuss it from this location rather than there and just go. going this way. Um, so if I'm just gonna share my screen really quick with everybody. Uh, this might be a slight overview from what we discussed um, uh, at the board, or committee meeting. Um, in June. Um, if the board remembers that back in March, uh, staff brought forward um, an ordinance that had somewhat of a uh, condition on granting the liquor licenses here in uh, the village. And there was a uh, sent, or the motion was to send back to the village um, staff to revise the ordinance, plus have somewhat kind of an overview um, of the alcohol licensing and how it would apply uh, to this ordinance in general. So again, um, so feel free to, to interrupt at any time during any questions. This is kind of a short and condensed version of what I presented at committee. So I'm just gonna kind of do a brief overview. Um, and again, on the timeline of this ordinance, uh, in March, this was submitted um, as uh, it, it went forward to committee and there were some issues with how the ordinance was defined. That there's a restaurant definition in there that the board had concerned about that they would like some revisions to. Um, and the and obviously the, this request for somewhat of a presentation regarding this ordinance. So it was recommended for denial of committee and then a board that was when it was sent back. In June it went forward with committee again with this presentation that I'm somewhat doing more, more of a longer version. Um, the staff did not bring it in the June board just because it was pretty packed at that June board and this would have maybe taken a lot longer for discussion so we felt that might be more appropriate for this uh, revision in the ordinance in this presentation to kind of come forward tonight. So the basic, I want to go over just kind of the basic licensing and where this kind of, where this would apply to. Um, I'm sorry, it might, this thought might be a little small, but basically in the village, there's two licenses that we prim primarily deal with. We're talking about class A licensing and class B licensing. So when there's a class A beer and liquor license, think of a, think of 
buying your alcohol, your beer and liquor at your store, grocery store, your liquor stores, your gas stations, and you're leaving with that alcohol. You're not consuming it there. That's your class A. Whereas a class B, you're buying it there and you're drinking it there. Think of your bars or restaurants. So under two categories, you have a class A beer and liquor, and you have a class B beer and liquor. So class A, you're buying it, you're leaving. And then the class B, you're buying it, you're consuming. Class B bar, think of it that way. And then class C, there's somewhat of a different uh, licensing requirements, but that is again, what the this is what the village primarily issues, class C wine license, class B beer, and then class A, uh, excuse me, class B beer and liquor, class A beer and liquor. So quickly, the village of Ashwaubenon on licensing quotas, some are uh, mandated by the state based on population, some are mandated by the ordinances. Um, as a class A liquor, the village um, has an ordinance that the quota that we have currently is 16 premises where you can sell class A liquor. Again, going into the store, buying your spirits and then leaving with it. That's your class A liquor. So we have 16 right now. Um, and then there's class A, just the beer. Again, going to store, buying your case of beer and leaving with it, that's your class A beer. We don't have a quote on that, that is unlimited. That's the same with the class B beer. So right now there's no limit on going into, I guess, just uh, an area where you want to just consume beer and that's it. No, no liquor attached, just beer. That's where you're going into an establishment and drinking it there. And the class B liquor, that's not an option for the village. That's uh, set by state statute and that's by uh, population. Um, as currently right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, we're at 33, I believe, and we're, I think, at, at capacity. I believe we are. Our quota for issuing the liquor license, the regular liquor license, is, is 33. Um, and then there's also, moving on, there's also what we call reserve licenses. So the 33 liquor licenses is set by population, and then there's three reserve licenses. And these reserve licenses are kind of primarily the more, more expensive ones. The, $10,000 for a liquor license, essentially. And then in addition to that, you have your Class B uh, liquor exceptions. Whereas the, the purpose behind this is for the state to say, well, if there's kind of an economic impact that this person wants to provide for community, why be limited to your reserve? Why be limited, why be limited to your quota, 33? So if you're gonna have a restaurant with 300 permanent seating, the, there's an exception in the state statute so you can get your liquor license. If you're gonna have a hotel that has 50 or more rooms, or it has a, uh, a restaurant or a banquet attached to that, then that's an economic impact for that community, we can have your liquor license. And again, the other one is an opera house. There's a lot of other detailed ones, but this is kind of premier the more popular ones you have. So again, these exceptions are after your quota has been met. So we can only give these when the, when the quota is, has been met. So right now, so, Robinon is at its quota believe so. I th we do not, according to our village clerk. So I'm not sure you would fill in. We have one, one regular, which has to go first, and then we have one reserve. So the reserve and the regular both have to be gone before we can do the exceptions, correct? Or I think no? Just the regular. Just the regular. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, so we have to the have the regular, but we could have some reserves and we could still do the exception one. Right, because that's totally different. The mm -hmm. reserve is, 10,000 plus the liquor license cost. So just so you're aware of that. Is the it 10,000 a year or 10,000 no, one time? No, that's an initial, it's not refundable. When at first the law changed, um, we could refund. Now you can't refund it and it's not transferable. And then isn't there something about buying them from neighboring municipalities too or something? Yeah, there's, um, yeah, there, we, we have an agreement um, where there's some on reserve basically from a neighboring community where you can have, as long as it's somewhat of um, uh, within a certain amount of miles and it's contiguous to, the, to your municipal boundaries, you can purchase, I think, up to three from them. Um, kind of on demand, not all at once. If one is available and we need it, we have the option to purchase it. So those are reserves also and those are 10,000 yes. from another municipality. Um, the exception ones, is there a 10,000 charge for that too, or no? Is that the standard cost for those? We don't charge mm -hmm. 10,000 for that. Okay. Just That's the just regular a regular fee. license. Okay. Right. As long as they meet those criteria. Correct. Got it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Questions so far besides those? Um, okay. Um, 
So how the licensing procedure works in the village thus far is an individual submits their applications and then the staff does a vetting uh, thorough background process um, as to uh, making sure they're uh, allowed to uh, well, sell certainly get their all their permits and licensing, licensing within the state. They have, um, they pay their fees, they have proper background checks, they're allowed to, I guess they're renting from, the part, from that establishment or their, uh, their actual owners. So once the village clerk's office, they kind of bundled everything up with the assistance of other staff departments, they submit it for the committee and the board to review with any kind of recommendations. That's the process right now. And if it's granted, the clerk issues a license according to um, the board's final authority. And that's the licensing procedure. So they apply to the clerk's office, review, put it all together, submit it, proved the clerk issues the license. Pretty straightforward. So, and I realize this is really difficult to see right now, and I'm, I'm just realizing that I don't know how to zoom in. Um, do that. So what's been kind of said last time in the March meeting and then again at committee level as well, the, um, the village has operated under this kind of um, tradition or, or past practice, so to speak, or uh, kind of a policy that it has where there's liquor licenses that are granted. Again, only licenses that are, think of your typical bar. Um, if you're gonna have this, you're gonna have something attached to it, some kind of business attached to it. Think of a restaurant. So if someone wants to come in and they wanna sell liquor, um, in the village, they have to have something like a grocery store or a hotel or a restaurant, for example. There always has to be something attached to it. That is the kind of standard uh, procedure that the village is operated on. This proposed ordinance essentially uh, takes that standard procedure and it applies it into law. So this person coming forward, they can, they can maybe want to sell a liquor license in the village, but they also have to have a, um, a restaurant or hotel, grocery store, movie theater, um, et cetera. So that basically just puts it into law. This uh, tradition is practice putting it into law. The restaurant definition you can kind of see here, um, this, was, this was kind of an issue. This was somewhat of, um, this was referred back to staff at last time. The staff did have a restaurant definition in that the board was uncomfortable with we had a 50% margin for food sales. So if the board recalls, we had a restaurant definition that said, your food sales must be 50 plus percent of your overall sales. And there might be some you know, arbitrary reason why that was, but basically the staff revised this and they, they kind of combined um, different areas in the state statutes and we kind of created our own restaurant definition. We removed that 50% threshold and we put in the definition in the restaurant as um, where the permanent building or room that has the a predominant activity of the prep, service, and sale of the foods. It's kind of what it, really what it comes down to. That is the definition of the restaurant uh, it, for this particular ordinance. So again, the ordinance would say that no Class B beer or liquor combination license can be granted unless someone has one of these additional things attached to it. By law, you can't even have discretion. The board doesn't have discretion. The board has discretion whether to determine if it's a restaurant or not, or maybe if it is considered a, I suppose, um, a club or society or lot or if so, but they won't be eligible for a liquor license unless they have one of these. Where the, where's this list come from? It comes from the state statutes under chapter 125, 32 sub 3M. So there still is discretion, but essentially there's an eligibility um, limitation for applicants. So can I so, clarify that real quick with yes. you? So mm -hmm. state statute also governs this and would say that a class B beer and liquor license, combination license, would have to have a hotel, a restaurant, a com combination. So that covers that? They don't. This is no. more of, um, right, it, it's not covered in that way in the state statute. So your typical bar could just be a bar wherever the municipality wants to be. Um, this is, um, found under this subsection as kind of a, a list where um, if you're just operating as a, um, excuse me, this was provided by state statute as something like you have to have an additional business if you put something um, 
um, else that might not uh, like a class B uh, beer license, Chris, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's there's a, a business component attached under this statute, I believe. It's, it's allowing these other businesses to have it. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the painting studio, for example, you're eligible this for a beer listing. license. Yes. So this is listing the other businesses that could have this type of license. It isn't it. prohibiting, it's just saying these are the kinds of businesses right. that can it, have it. As an example, you don't see a salon up there. Right. Okay. So they, yeah, because we don't Correct. Yeah. allow that. Yeah. Okay. Correct. And then this is just an example. It's not an exhaustive list. So if the board's uncomfortable with having um, you know, a painting studio out of there to get the liquor license, you certainly can remove something like that as well. This is just the example of what the statutes have already given. This is where that list comes from. So applying this ordinance, if it was to be adopted um, and imposed, so basically how it would work is every liquor license that every application that um, comes forward would still go to the village board. Um, at the June committee, there was some reserve there that the staff might have too much discretion as to who is eligible and who's not. So initially it was the staff could maybe determine if that person qualified under the list or not. Uh, and the staff would then forward that forward to the board for review. Um, and there was some hesitation there just based on the board wanting to be the ultimate uh, gatekeepers and the ones in, uh, granting the license. So if this ordinance were to be adopted, the village or the staff would basically take the application and send it forward. We certainly tell the applicant that maybe that you're, you're not going to get your license. You're ineligible if you come forward with just a sports bar idea. You don't have anything else. You can still apply, but you are ineligible. Like the board will not give you a license, but that's not our, up to us. That is just up to us to advise the board to grant or not. So every applicant Every, every application would still come before the board if this were adopted, regardless of what it is. However, the staff would certainly tell the board if they're eligible for, for it or not. So the board still has the discretion to say if one qualified as a restaurant and one didn't. So here are a couple of examples. So if someone comes in, they, have a, they want a, a liquor license in the village, and uh, they have a restaurant, the staff would just take that application, pilot everything together just as we normally would and send it to the board as your standard procedure um, for, for review. That's the pretty basic, that's the easy one. If someone comes forward and they say, well, I want a liquor license in the village. And they say, I want I have a really, really cool idea. It's a really cool sports bar, it doesn't have any food. That's, that's it, just really a neat place, but it's just a bar. It doesn't meet any of the other eligible requirements, it's not a hotel, bowling alley, restaurant, et cetera. The staff will tell that individual that by law you can't get a license, but we are not the ultimate person, or we're not the deciding people on, on it, that's up to the board. So we'll take the app application and send it to the board with recommendation for denial because they are ineligible to have one. But that decision for denial is ultimately up to the board. Um, but under this ordinance, they would not not they would not be allowed to uh, have a liquor license in the village because they don't have anything else attached to it. So if, if a cool, if we adopted this mm -hmm. and a cool idea comes up, let's say for a speakeasy or a champagne bar, or I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there right now that we don't have in Ashwaubenon because our historically, our policy has been to have food involved. Um, but I'm telling you, the future is headed toward let the bars be the bars, let the restaurant be the restaurant, and you have like a QR code that you scan with your phone while you're at the bar and the surrounding restaurants, little dudes come in and say, Tracy, is Tracy here? And you get your food that way. Um, uh, if we adopt this, we can't give those people the license then. We'd have to make an exception to the ordinance or something. I'm obviously against it. I voted to not adopt this door. I voted to deny it because I like I like have I think it's too early to do this right now. Let's just keep it the way it is where every application comes to us. There might be a really cool idea that I don't even know about yet that we might want to let somebody have just a tavern. I don't know what kind. Maybe a champagne bar, maybe a speakeasy, maybe a I don't know what. Um but if we adopt this, you're not going to be able to have any just taverns in Ashwaman. Do we really want to do that? 
Correct. I mean, it would be inadvisable to make start making exceptions. I mean, uh, to that if, We'd if it doesn't to meet the definition. We'd have to change this ordinance or redo something. Let's just right. not adopt it. Don't have the staff say anything about historical practices. Just bring every application to us and let us have the discretion to decide do we want to give this applicant their license or not on a case by case basis. Yeah, that, that's that's very fair, right? That's absolutely you can do that. Still within the board's discretion. Um, then that's that's completely fine to keep it a status quo. Um, the if there is one that's close, right? If, if let's hypothetically say this were adopted, and an applicant comes forward and they have something close, a speakeasy with maybe some food, maybe not. Do they really qualify as a restaurant? Do they not? I mean, um, what's up with this QR code scan stuff and um, wristbands and what and whatnot? The, the staff would have no um, input on it whatsoever. Like if this if this were adopted, they would just staff would just pile everything together, bring it forward, and it's up to the board to determine if it's a restaurant or not. See, Again, I, if it were adopted, I don't adopted. think that makes sense. I mean, if we have this ordinance that says if you don't have a restaurant, you can't get a license. Why would you even present it to us? You guys just screen them, and if they don't have a if they don't have a restaurant, why waste our time? That's the part I don't like, though. You know what I mean? We don't get to see it then. Otherwise, well, if you're going to have the ordinance, enforce it. If you're not going to have it, then send everything through to us. And we certainly can. And I, I just, I, rec I kind of put that alternative in there because a committee, I know the committee didn't have, was not comfortable with the staff screening them. We right. certainly can enforce it. And if it's close, we'll absolutely send it forward. Um, I mean, I'm getting the, the, uh, the indication that it's this not received, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, right, this, this close and what's not. But the staff's not going to necessarily have any input in determining what that is. That's I think it gets clear the board. with which ones should we send, which sure. ones should Absolutely. we, shouldn't we? And I also think at, at the committee level, there was a concern also about if we're going to have this requirement that you have to have a restaurant and it's in, it's in the ordinance, now it's part of the code, Who's going to enforce that for the people who already are out there with liquor licenses? Because there are restaurants, bar restaurants out there that it's it's going to be iffy. I mean, do they have a full service restaurant? What's the definition? Are we going to have like a compliance officer going around and checking at Urkel's and B2 and Anduzi's and the bar? And I mean, a lot of these places, I mean, they're... Restaurant closes at nine. I've right, been to right. a lot of them. Okay, right. and they're open till two. So it's like. If, if I could just add some context to the conversation a little bit and kind of tie into some of the conversation as it relates to who reviews the applications, who ultimately approves the applications and so on and so forth. And I'll kind of walk through it to, to your last question, uh, Kelly. So first and foremost, statutes require the village board be the authority that approves or denies a license application for this regard. So unlike an operator's license, we do not have the ability under statutory law to approve as staff approve or deny. Whereas with an operator's license, there is a carve out within the statutes that allows the uh, municipal board to delegate that authority to staff so long as they meet certain criteria requirements, background checks, so on and so forth. So like Chris can issue an operator's license if they pass their background check and meet all the conditions of the application. But that's done by design, both statutorily and then by adopted ordinance. So the board has passed and delegated that authority. With licenses like a class A or class B, in particular class B combination license, the board always has to approve that license. I do not believe that there's a carve out within the statutes that allows you to delegate that authority to staff. So I think what Patrick is, is suggesting is that if an applicant were to come, and let's say the board adopted the ordinance that required the restaurant provision on a combination Class B license, what staff would be doing is forwarding that on to you to, as a board with a recommendation for denial because it doesn't meet the legislative intent that you had created through the ordinance, if that makes sense. So you, the board ultimately adopts the policy. It's your policy to administer. We're here as your guide to let you know that Remember, board, you adopted this ordinance. It says you have to have a restaurant. Here's the definition. Therefore, staff is recommending denial based on your policy. When an applicant comes in, in the event that that policy or that ordinance has been adopted, 
we advise that applicant at the forefront saying, hey, look, you don't have a restaurant. Our board is required under its code, a restaurant, whatever that definition is, you can continue to apply, that's fine, and it will be presented to the board as is, as is required under the law, but just be advised it, it's likely to be denied because it doesn't meet the conditions of its code, right, of the board's code. So I think that's kind of the context that we would have. Backing up a little bit, a lot of this conversation stemmed from, the, from a prior applicant for uh, a facility that was being viewed as kind of just a bar. And there was a request by the board at that point that, boy, this license would be uh, pal more palatable, if you will, or more provable in our, in our eyes if they had a full service restaurant. Because in the, in the past that was required or requested or uh, uh, definitely weighted in consideration on the issuance of a license. So that's kind of where we took it as staff is we were given albeit somewhat of a loose direction from the board to come up with something that would give us standing or footing to be on in the event another applicant like that previous license request came in would be presented to you. Then you would have some firm footing to say, no, we're gonna deny this application because it doesn't meet the restaurant provision. So that's, that's where that is. Uh, ultimately, it's still your decision as to whether or not legislatively you wanna have that requirement. Um, as suggested, if the requirements in the code, it limits your, your ability to discern over an applicant. If it's removed from that, you have a greater degree of um, discretion in determining whether that license should be issued based on its operations. Again, so long as it's meeting the statutory requirements. As far as enforcement goes, your, your question is, is spot on. Would it require additional enforcement than what is present today? Probably not, um, but in order to maintain compliance, it would need some type of inspection. Uh, and then in addition to that, even if they were violating the ordinance as it would be written for restaurants, it would still require us as a municipality to go through a revocation process then in order to remove the license. And that can be a rather cumbersome and, and clunky process then at that point. So it, adding some additional weight into that is really comes down to what is the impact or outcome that you wanna achieve by creating this provision within the code? Do you only want like rest combination restaurant bars in your community? If so, I would recommend enacting the ordinance. If you want to have the ability to have discretion and determine on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not a place should have a full-service menu or actual waiters and waitresses working in the restaurant, um, then I would say leave it out because now at the present time you have that ability within your approval process. I, from when I sat in that public works meeting and I, and I mentioned this to, to Joel and Patrick before, I think the concern was that the board doesn't have the ability, if, if like Kelly says, something really cool would come, that we you can't issue it if you pass the ordinance. Because you, you will break your own ordinance, which you can't do, and you can't just willy-nilly change your ordinances all the time. So I think that was That's the concern. exactly what it was. We right. went round You and wanted round the, and the control. Right, and the committee determined that we would rather have the discretion be in the hands of the board to decide on a case by case. We can keep our practice going if we want to, our historical practice of requiring a restaurant. We don't have to have this ordinance to do that. And and if it turns out, let's say we do a, well, let's say we approve a bar, we approve a speakeasy, and then we approve a champagne bar. And now we think, you know, two is probably enough in a community of 17,000. We can adopt this then. It doesn't have to be now is my point. Well, it's all drafted, we can put it on the back burner, but I'm gonna move that we deny it. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have more discussion? Yeah. Um, to me, a lot of it, I wanna go back to the definition of a restaurant. That's totally at our, our discretion. Yeah, and I, I apologize. I um, well, this is just what a proposed, the proposed definition is. And I, I apologize. I'm going a little quick, um, because I know this is kind of, a, we've been down this path twice already. And why this is being brought forward again, 
again, it was revised, it was directed the staff to revise, bring back, and it's that committee for denial. So we can't just sit on the ordinance. So this restaurant definition was altered um, to kind of uh, engage what the board had considered as removing that 50% threshold, but that's where we inserted the language of predominant activity. So it's not set in stone what the restaurant definition is. And it certainly can be amended again if it's revised back. So what it, so we're here because it, it was all cut off, chopped up last. So what is right now the definition of a restaurant okay. uh, proposed here? You want me to read to you, Chris? Yeah. Okay, verbatim. So the restaurant shall be defined as a permanent building, room, or place at which the predominant activity is the preparation, service, or sale of meals, the transients, or the general public, primarily for the consumption on the premises, and which has sufficient staff and seating for the volume of food sold and customers served, and does not include snacks, soft drinks, um, ice cream, milk, drinks, ices, or confections, like sweets and candies, things like it that. does not include Does not include that. So, right, you're... Think of your typical, like, if you want to come in just for maybe, all right, I want uh, just a pretzel, please, and uh, vodka tonic or whatever, yeah. gin and tonic. You, it, that wouldn't be considered a restaurant if it's just like a very bare bones um, finger foods, yeah. it, it, in my opinion, according to this definition. Okay. Frozen pizza. I mean, we, we could play with hypotheticals a lot. I mean, I would consider something to be full service. Menu, uh, wait staff. Um, sufficient to support the customers. So things like if, if it's just, it depends how many finger foods you have. And again, this is where the board's discretion is gonna come in a little bit. If I'm not, we are not gonna be the ones to determine if that meets the definition of a restaurant. I can give you my opinion on, it, on if it does or not, but the board's the one that's gonna be the ultimate authority to define, make sure it's, it meets the definition on here. So if you have frozen pizza with you know, 10 other I guess finger foods or, or appetizers or something along with some wait staff or, or whatnot and the board feels that's that's comfortable in their, their eyes to meet the dis, um, restaurant definition that that's predominant activity of the selling of the okay. food by, by all means that that would meet the definition so I, I'm not quite understanding what's changing from the proposal to what we had before there was a, the there's a 50 percent threshold there's a 50 percent threshold and then this was at the, some of the languages added for somewhat of a more full service where there's the preparation the, uh, and, and the sale as well as enough staff to meet your capacity for the food and the customers served. So the difference is 50% to the word predominantly. Um, that was added, yes. I mean, I, yes. I'm, I'm just for some reason not grasping the difference between the, the board had a, a concern two. last time where who's going to check the sales receipts you're going to go to the DOR and, and ask for receipts to make sure it's 50% are you going to go into the and do these or the bar right now and make sure there's this 50% and, and no I mean that's kind of up to the state that's not necessarily up to us so that so this um, gives a little more leeway it, it does yeah in the sense of well we're not going to go in and regulate if it's a if there's there's a 50% threshold where did that come from that that wasn't arbitrary that's if you want a wine license you need that that's you need to have 50 percent or more of your food sales so that's for a wine license only that's, that's by, where we got that's by that. state right mm -hmm. the wine one yes okay. it is that's where we got that and that was incorporated first but that 50 percent was just you know, how are we even going to regulate that that was un un uncomfortable and there were some comments as comments as to um well significant sales or the majority of and i said well let's take out sales just that alone let's do predominant activity of everything combined prep, service, sales, eating, I guess, for example. And that's kind of where we came from. The restaurant is very loosely defined in, in state statutes in certain areas. So we yeah. uh, pulled maybe three or four different areas in the statutes and put them together. What we thought would best fit our practice for this, this ordinance. I just think we can, we can continue our practice without the ordinance. We don't need the ordinance, but the, if we do adopt this ordinance, we're not going to have any taverns or any other creative type of just alcohol businesses in this village, just so you know. Why would we limit ourselves that way at this point? We don't have any. <laughs> I, 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 I pretty much agree with your point. You know, it's really handcuffing a small business owner mm -hmm. with a really unique idea. It really is. And that's what, and I agree with you, that's kind of where community, or communities but this industry is is heading if you travel at all it's those really neat little social 
places that people are that like to sit and converse and not have to be in a huge environment. And I think we're potentially we can convert. That. We can convert in any one of these bars we got now. I don't see where we're trying to get rid of the little man. Uh, now, all we're doing is making an ordinance for the pra past practices that we've been doing. Correct. That's all we're doing. Correct. Yes. It's quit all the other talk we've done. We're going to put an ordinance for the past practices that we've been doing. With some other elements, like defining a restaurant, because in my opinion, I think and restaurant is pretty. We define that. You know, and Jay made a, when yeah. Jay was talking, he made yes. a good point. What's the 50%? Nobody really knows that. And is it policeable? Yes, yeah, policeable, but nobody's complaining about it. So, and, and they're all selling a good amount of food. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I, I disagree. I, I know where you're going with this. There's some neat things out there. But the, the neat ones that I know are in existence have food. They just opened one up in uh, Door County. It's, co it's called uh, the Spotted Cow. It's a tap house. Same principle as what we went through uh, this year, which never came about. The building is up for lease again. It, it, I don't know where it went. I don't want to say something I don't know. But there's a for lease sign in front of the building again. Mm -hmm. But the one that... The ones that I do know are open, they do have food. What the percentage is, I have no idea, but it's available. And the one that we worked with put in a fast type food to give to the customers. We worked with them and it made it work. So I don't see any problem on where we're going with something like this. It's just a past practice that we're putting in ordinance. Here's the cap, Kelly. If, if this doesn't get adopted, we go back to what we had before, correct? Yes. Which is a hard 50%. No, it's not. Uh, no. Well, it's, it's mm, no. A, there, there's no. no, there's no there threshold. Not, it's just there's up no to the board's discretion. Nothing. Right. This just no. takes the practice and defining it more, putting it into a rule. There, there was never a 50% threshold. Well, it was more of. We just talked no. about. So, no. the, yeah, just I'll add some, some context. So the, there is a motion on the floor right now with a second to deny the proposed ordinance. What that effectively does is there would be no change under the municipal code at all as it relates to this. The question about 50%, the definition of, an, of a restaurant, stems from prior conversations at both board and committee level only. It, it takes into no effect with, with the provision within the code. Okay. Right. So there was right. some conversation that the board and staff had at previous meetings about the defini definition of a restaurant, because that was really the, the, the crux of the issue. And the initial thought or conversation was, well, let's just take what statutes have for a definition of a restaurant under a Class C license and use that. And the statutes identify that 50% threshold. So there was conversation about, well, how do you determine 50%? And maybe we should just remove that provision. And, and, and Patrick had done that in that draft, in the draft that's presented to you today. So the 50% regardless is not in the proposed language, even though it uh, has a motion for denial anyway, yeah. just not to add so any confusion. So it wasn't in our past <laughs> no, no. ordinance. It's, it's okay. great. Yeah, think, it, there's no 50% in there right now. Okay. Yeah. I think that the concern what I, what I felt at the committee level was that it takes the discretion away from the board. You will not ever have discretion. You will see every applicant that comes, but you won't have discretion to grant a license if something unique came. You can still go with our past practice if you so choose and continue on with the, you know, our version of what what was done in the past, but you won't have any discretion if you pass the ordinance. That is what I think was the big concern. That's exactly what happened. And if, if you want to honor what the committee agonized over <laughs> and came up with, we moved to deny because we can keep going exactly how we are without this ordinance. And we can adopt this ordinance in the future if you feel like Ash Babanon is getting too many taverns at some point in the future. We have none right now. And I don't have any in the back burner that I'm, you know, people are contacting me saying, I really have this good idea. I want to do this. I'm just saying 
Let's keep our options open. We still have all the power we had before. We don't need it right now. And the committee, that's how the committee voted. So, I mean, if you're going to do good group decision making, in my opinion, you have the committee do the work, they make a recommendation, and then you adopt or deny that recommendation. But typically, you would adopt the committee's recommendation, which is to deny it. Can I just, I have a couple things. One, if this is denied, Patrick, and say we get a champagne bar, and then another one comes and everyone thinks we don't need another one. And we don't, and it's denied. Can we be sued for um, discrimination? Um, well, discrimination would just depend on the applicant and who it would be. It'd have to They're, be a protected class. You'd sure. have to have race or gender or some kind of protected classification that we discriminated on the basis right. of. Which we, I mean, that's so far down the line. We don't even have one yet. You'd have to have two and have a protected class of classification mm -hmm. sure to meet that to meet that threshold yeah typically um is there some kind of claim that somebody could say you prove this bar not that bar you prove that bar not my bar no i mean maybe maybe but as long as the board can justify the reasons for denial and it's not arbitrary the i'm sorry the board has a lot of discretion when it considers this is right in our ordinance this bottom point here Section 301C, the social impact, the economic impact, community impact, and the uniqueness of that establishment. That's in our code right now. And if the board wants to approve one and not the other, based on that, they certainly can. can anybody say, make a claim for something, I suppose, but you know, it's, it, there needs to be some kind of justification for denying it. Right. And my I, other... I think with the brain power in this room, I mean, if we really didn't want to apply it, uh, grant the second one for whatever reason, it would be a rational reason. It wouldn't be a discriminatory reason. You know what I mean? My other suggestion would be maybe do a business plan. Because if you look at the liquor license applications, nowhere does it say, this is what I want to do. They're just asking for a liquor license. So if you have a business plan, at least you'd have a document to look at before you come in to understand what they're doing and you can ask questions. So if we could if we could add that. I That's think a, that'd great be a great idea. idea. And that would give us mm -hmm. deniability if anybody did come at us for a denial because we could say, you know, this is what you proposed and we're against it for this or that reason or that's a great idea. I would agree with Kelly that we need to be able to maintain discussion on something if it comes in. What if something really cool does come in? I was just at a place a month ago and all they served was coffees and ice creams and they were infused and spiked and they had floats and it was amazing and they did have food, donuts, right there. The spiked malts? Yes, and it was amazing. Like it was a very cool, I could easily see that being on the corner in Ashwaubenon somewhere. And this ordinance would completely kick it out, and we wouldn't be able to do anything with it. Now, because they don't serve food, I don't. That wouldn't. Okay. Um, I think the village already has controls on our license. We have a cap from the state. We have only so many licenses we can give. So, to get overrun, we have some protection that way already because of the number of licenses that we have. Um, my concern with the, the business that came before us that kind of started all of this, that spearheaded this, um, I had some concerns about them and I didn't think they should have gotten a license. Um, and some of the things that we were talking about were very arbitrary and didn't have set things. And then for someone to enforce that, that was my concern as well. How the heck are we gonna enforce this 50% or that their, their revenue has to be so much for food and so much for alcohol? So that was my concern about that. And I think this piece of the ordinance puts us in that same boat again of being kind of arbitrary and how does someone define restaurant? Like Chris was saying, how is that defined? And is it clear? I can look at it slightly different than Patrick Ken or somebody else. So I would agree with Kelly. I think we need to leave this open and it needs to come to the board and I would definitely deny this piece of the ordinance and let us look at it and see what we want to do with it. Um, things are changing out there and there's a lot of I think interesting unique things that can come and I just hate to limit our ability to react to that. Okay. So Great you're discussion. letting everything wide open again. What you doing? 
pretty much. Well, we can we can have past practice, Gary. Yes. Um, right. Of, of, you know, but without an ordinance, anything can come in front of us. Is what Kelly's wanting. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's everything okay, has come, come in front of us before. <clears throat> and you know what? I I think the conversation is that um, they just want to see everything and the board make the decision, not an ordinance that we put into place that two years from now something cool like the spiked milkshakes can't come before the board. Mm -hmm. So, or we can't we can't approve it. So, anyway, it, it seems to me right now we're just not quite getting it right with this ordinance, and so why, why pass it right now? We don't need to. Well, that's, no, let's we can do it right. That's you kind know. of where I'm looking at. If I had, I would deny. I would table this thing and let it let us di digest it some more. Well, we have a motion to deny, so we, you know, we can't table. So. I, I can, realize it, that. You can always come back, you know. So. Well, we won't know till the next one comes. Yep. And how many of them come? Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to deny. Is there any more discussion? Can I just add one thing? I liked Chris's idea about putting the business, requiring a business plan. Can that be added or can that not be discussed at this point with this discussion? But I think that's a great idea. I think what we can do, Tracy, is that the motion for deny, assuming it passes, well, uh, there's direction to the staff to look at it forth further and then bring an ordinance to maybe amending the licensing procedures regarding that specifically. Okay. So with direction from staff, certainly. Okay, we have a motion and a second to deny. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carried. Mary, just, okay. I do have about, I'd say I have a half an hour more of Presentation is that okay? Um, as long as it's 29 minutes. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. You put a lot of work into that. Okay, 11L. Consider discuss act recommendation on draft 2024 salary and wage grade matrix for non-represented general employees. Joel. Okay, thank you, Madam President. Uh, in your packet is a proposed wage and salary matrix uh, updated to include uh, a few adjustments, one based on uh, cost of living increase for year over year, June to June, so uh, basically the full month of June, so starting July 1. In addition to that is a recommended change to wages based on a survey data that we collected over the last few months for wages uh, marked for 2023. Um, just as a recap, if you recall, the village adopted a wage and salary matrix grade-based plan last year. It includes 15, um, uh, uh, excuse me, it includes several grades, each with 15 steps. The minimum is the base wage. Step eight includes the midpoint, and it ends with a step 15 max wage for that grade. In accordance to village policy as adopted within our employee handbook, the village board has sole discretion to make adjustments to that matrix based on recommendations from the village manager. Um, two conditions within that policy are, are as follows in the, in the memo that's included in the packet. One is related to cost of living increase based on the consumer price index. And again, that June over June um, increase is approximately 3%. In addition to that, based on um, market conditions and, and in order to maintain competitiveness with current wages and competing municipalities, uh, the village has the ability to adjust the matrix to reflect those competing interests and challenges. And so village staff has done that as well. And you can see that in the draft matrix in what would be the blue column each graded position has an increase adjustment proposed at either one and a half up to 3% per, per wage. Based on that uh, acknowledgement, CPI and grade adjustments, uh, each position would see a base wage increase of between four and a half and 6%. Uh, backing up then to those wage adjustments based on 2023 wages, um, when we put this matrix together, we did so early in 2022. Village Board adopted the matrix at a similar time period in calendar year as you are reviewing the proposed changes today in an effort to help us prepare for the 2023 budget. 
However, during that time, many municipalities went through and adjusted their wages shortly after our wage matrix had been um, adopted. And due to high inflation and uh, volatile labor markets, some of those increases were pretty substantial in other municipalities, anywhere from five to, to eight percent. And so what we wanted to do this year, knowing that many of those municipalities had substantial increases, was to verify and compare our current wages with our, with our competitors, if you will, to maintain that competitive advantage. And so in your packet, most positions have been evaluated to comparables. Those tables are included just to provide reference to you in order for you to ensure that we've done our homework and basically show our math, if you will, uh, ultimately on our graded base pay plan. Ultimately, what we're trying to achieve is have each position based on its grade be within that 85th percentile of comp competitive market. We don't necessarily want to be above that because ultimately we, we would prefer administratively not to be the pace setter. Because oftentimes when you're the pace setter when it comes to wages, you're kind of shooting blanks and you're not necessarily certain that uh, you're being competitive. You could be overshooting the market, if you will. But staying within that 85th percentile ultimately ensures that you're going to stay highly competitive to your competitors, but certainly not, not that pace setter. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is that each position annually is reviewed as part of its annual review for job descriptions to ensure that the position is graded correctly within the matrix, and we did identify uh, approximately 11 positions that would get some type of grade adjustment based on the comparable data that we received from the local municipalities. And for each of those positions, they were identified in the comparable sheets that would show move from example step five to step six or step six to step seven. Um, this particular matrix was presented to finance and personnel uh, this month. They did recommend approval of the matrix. Ultimately, what we are looking for tonight is a recommendation from the board to continue with the numbers as proposed as part of the budget process. If you recall with the budget timeline, we will be coming back to the board in September to, to discuss wages, benefits, things of that nature. Um, what I'm hoping to do tonight is get uh, a recommendation from the board so that as we begin the budgeting process, we, we have kind of a foundation and a baseline to work from. Ultimately, we recognize the board's gonna wanna see the big picture and how these changes in wages impact the financial outlook for the village from a budget, budgetary standpoint. So we recognize that and at this point, what you're seeing tonight are just numbers on paper. You will need to formally adopt a change to the matrix in the future based on the budget outcomes that will be presented for the 2024 fiscal year. Uh, so with that, uh, the only thing, other thing that I will add is a recommendation from staff that was discussed uh, to great length at finance and personnel, and that is to move the chief's position out of the general employee salary and wage matrix and place it into what's called the command staff um, grade table for public safety. And the reason for that is to, uh, in an attempt to avoid compression issues between the wage of the chief and the deputy chief. With the command staff schedule, they get pay increases based on a set wage and a percent increase that is determined by comparable data as designed under the union contract with the association. That way, um, if you're a public safety officer looking to move into, let's say, a lieutenant position, there is a gap in pay because there's an increase in responsibility. If those positions did not keep up with the rate of inflation that the union officers receive, compression could occur. And then from each position thereafter, from lieutenant to captain, from captain to deputy chief to, to chief, they would all increase at an equal ratio to avoid compression over time. Uh, so that was the recommendation from, from staff. The committee did uh, have some discussion and that discussion re revolved around the ability to um, maintain a little higher degree of control over wages for the chief's position. 
you would effectively have a higher degree of control if it's left into the general employee matrix because then it's not bound to union contracts and the, the comparable data that's generated from that. Um, it's, it's really a preference from the board's perspective. I think if you want to avoid compression, uh, certainly put it in the command staff schedule. If you want to maintain control and a little bit uh, higher degree of flexibility, I would keep it in the general employee matrix as well. So with that, I'll answer any questions from the board. Well, Joel, to keep you a decent uh, staff on board, I think it's a good idea that you move forward with this uh, so that we continue to have uh, decent people within our village here working for us. For the um, public safety director position, will that position still be go through a performance evaluation process similar to what is going on now? And obviously, if they're moving to the command schedule for raises, then they're give, there's a given amount they're going to get. So that, that's my question. Are they still going to be evaluated and still base? Then their wages really will not be based on that. That is correct. So that, that's one of the trade-offs. So um, it, there's, there's a little bit of a plus and a minus to that. So placing it in the command staff schedule, you have a flat wage that is ultimately determined for increases based on the union contract. Whereas with the general employee matrix, there are steps that can be earned or attained based on performance factors. With that being said, regardless of where that position sits on, on either matrix, a performance evaluation would be completed. And then um, besides the increases that you just mentioned here, um, and we brought this up at finance as well, there still is some money that you have discretion on for bonuses, correct, that you will be able to give out above and beyond this? Uh, correct. So within the employee handbook, there is a merit pay bonus program that is solely determined, uh, well, I shouldn't say solely, so there's two components of it. One component, the board would have to identify funds that it would be, a, would be applied to the program. So as an example, uh, at the end of a fiscal period, there's um, a, a healthy fund balance. And the board says, you know, we want to dedicate $10,000 or $20,000 to the merit pay bonus program. That would go into that pool. And then based on that policy and based on performance scores for employees, they would get a portion of that 10 or $20,000. So if you have an employee that scores exceptionally well on their annual review, let's say they get a $1,000 bonus. Somebody that performs uh, good, kind of think about a, a score of five, four, three, two, one, they score four, maybe they get a $500 bonus. Uh, that bonus would be applicable one time and only as funding is available within that pool for that calendar year. Could we also in the future, let's say pull a public safety director's position out, could it be put back into the general categories again? Yeah, there's no, you're not bound under any contract or any formal arrangement. Um, the only thing that would prohibit you from doing that is if you entered into, let's say a separate employment agreement with the public safety chief or the chief of public safety. Um, so yeah, you, you would still maintain that discretion. So there's basically two issues we're looking at. One is do we want to move the public safety director's position to the command format or do we want to keep it in the matrix? And I kind of feel like I, I would rather keep it in the matrix because we have more flexibility because what if he's super high performing and we want to give him more than he would have gotten under the standard increase from the union or whatever, we can't. If he just is in that command structure, I mean, we could do a bonus. But I, I like keeping that position in the matrix so that we have more control, basically. Um, the other part where it's the 11 positions that you're adjusting the matrix, basically, I was concerned during the finance committee meeting because I felt like we just created this matrix and now we're already adjusting the matrix. It felt somehow a little wonky to me, but I understand now that if you had the data that you got later when we made the matrix, we wouldn't be making this adjustment now. The matrix would have been bumped up from the beginning, right? That, that is correct. So just wages were extremely volatile last year with inflation, yeah, correct? Right. So now I, I, to, I totally, uh, I'm totally on board with the 3% cost of living. I'm on board with the adjusting the numbers because of the data we got. But I, I would 
I would keep the public safety director in the matrix. You know, I have mixed feelings on the public safety director's position as well, um, but I'm concerned about compression too. Um, you know, we want to be able to get a chief. We can handle the compression with, to a certain extent. How we pay him in the matrix, though. You could, to a certain extent, but like Joel was mentioning, when you have them looked at in a totally separate way, you know, the command, the rest of the command staff is handled this way, and then the chief is handled this way, there is a chance that you can get some compression, and the chief isn't getting the raises as much as his command staff is. So that's my concern with not, you know, with not allowing them to go to the command schedule. I think if we're cognizant of it, it's never going to happen because we know we're, we're watching for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I guess the question I have is, is the compression um, controlled by a percentage or a number? Like, are you saying this position has to be a certain percentage higher than the position below it? Or is it like number, like it has to be 3,000 more or 5,000 more? Or Sure, I, I think it depends on uh, two factors. So the initial setup, so how, how we would set it up at the onset of if we were to move that position to the command staff schedule it would base, be based on a flat dollar amount over and above the deputy chief position. That's how it's set up right now when you differentiate between lieutenants, captains, commander, deputy chief. So it'd be a flat dollar amount. Um, if you were to keep the, that position out of the command staff schedule, it's really more based on a percentage situation. So let's say under union contract, there's a 3% increase that the public safety officers get that again uh, moves through the entire command staff schedule. But let's say the board adopts a 2% cost of living increase to the matrix and that happens over a successive number of years where command staff or officer staff get a larger increase based on comparables, but village board adopts a 2% increase over a period of time and the general staff, you could get that, that creeper, that compression between predominantly that deputy chief position and the chief position. And that's what, what you're ultimately trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. Now with that uh, also just, so we're you know fully transparent right now, um, there isn't a compression issue per se with our current staff and the command staff schedule. In the event that chief, who's sitting right here, let's say he retires or resigns this position and we're at a point where we need to hire somebody. Um, that's where it could become a little bit of a challenge, especially if it's maintained in the general matrix because the, the position's wa complete wage is less than the deputy chief position. So in order to attract even an internal candidate, you would want to take into consideration that factor, that it's less than the current deputy chief position. And I guess my point here is you can leave it as it is. Uh, to a certain degree, it's, it's likely to financially benefit the incumbents to the position right now. In the event those positions become vacated, we could review it again at that point and determine what, what's most appropriate. Can't you kind of control that though by where you enter them into the matrix, like put them out of this step instead of that step, or you know what I mean? Yes, yep, there could be, certainly. I, I guess for me, I would probably put him in the matrix because we can always watch it. I mean, we're. We always have to be aware of the compression issues. I mean, all these years we've always had that issue. I think the compression issue happens a lot more between the um, lieutenants and captains. And and it, as long as we're aware of that upper tier, I I think that we can be aware of it and and control it that way. Well, and it'll be adjusted every year through the market, correct? So we'll look correct. at it every year, just like we're doing at these 11 positions that we're changing, so it'll adjust that way as well. Correct. Correct. So I would put them in the matrix. And just as a reference, so the, in the packet, the position is not included in the graded scale, but based on last year, when we did the position analysis, the chief of public safety would grade out at a pay grade 14, just to give you a reference at this point. Um, 
again, with the incumbents in place right now, there would not be a compression issue. That compression issue would likely only occur if somebody were to vacate the position then at that point. So if, if it's agreeable to the board, I guess I, I would recommend just to maintain the matrix as it is with the chief currently in the matrix. We would plan for that budgetarily wise. Uh, and then at some point, if there's a, a discussion to be had or a recommendation from the board to change that, um, then I, you know, we can certainly bring that back and make that change. Okay, I'd make a motion to re recommend the staff to use the proposed 2024 salary and wage grade matrix adjusted as presented to draft the 2024 budget at leaving the public safety director position in the general matrix. matrix. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to recommend the draft 2024 salary and wage grade matrix and also to put the chief position in the matrix. Everybody understand? Sure. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, number 12, items for next agenda. We will have a next agenda. So I believe our next meeting is August 22. So um, prepare. Um, number 13, closed session items. During the meeting, the Village Board of the Village of Ashwabna may convene into closed session pursuant to item A and B as listed in our agenda. Village Board may thereafter reconvene in open session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute Section 19.85, Parent 2, to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. I need a motion to go into closed session, please. Move to approve, second. Motion and a second to go into closed session. Roll call, please. President Kardoski. Yes. Trustee Paul. Yes. Trustee Atkinson. Yes. Trustee Zerbel. Yes. Trustee Service. Yes. And Trustee Fluke. Yes. Okay, we are in closed session. Thank you, everybody. This conference is no longer being recorded.